Are we in an AI bubble? Now, Sam Altman says we are, but today I wanted to investigate it. I wanted to make the case for if we are in an AI bubble, yes. And if we aren't in an AI bubble, no. And then I wanted to end this episode with what this all means. What does it mean if we're in an AI bubble? What does that mean for your startup? And if we aren't, what does that mean? So let's start with the case for we're in an AI bubble. Why would people say we are in an AI bubble? The first reason is there's just tons of hype around AI startups. When you scroll on X today, I know that you've seen some of these you know, demo videos of AI startups. They're cinematic. They're well done. They probably cost $100,000 to make. And they're everywhere. It's standard. Uh, it's the equivalent of when I was coming up uh, in startups, being on TechCrunch, you had to be on TechCrunch. That's the demo video today. People spending tons of money on demo videos. Um, the other thing about tons of hype is people say that marketing is trumping the AI products, that there's a lot of products that aren't that good uh, relative to their marketing. Now, I actually haven't used the Cluely product, but Cluely is like the poster child for the best marketing right now for AI startups. I saw this Instagram post today. Cluely engineer buys a $500,000 Ferrari. This is just marketing that gets people talking. Now, the question is, is the Cluely product as good as their marketing? Maybe it is. Maybe it's even better. But there are a bunch of products that have really good marketing, that the product people try it and they're like, it's just not there. The second reason why people say that there's an AI bubble is that the valuations are getting insane. Seed round valuations, it's not uncommon for them to be 20 to $30 million. When you think of that, think of a 20 to $30 million building you could buy. That's the equivalent, right? two or three people start a company and all of a sudden their business is worth $25 million. That is a lot. Uh, you know, that is twice what it was five to 10 years ago. Now, the other thing is seed rounds that are in the five to $10 million range are pretty common now uh, for a hot, hot AI seed startup. Uh, my friend Riley Brown, friend of the pod, he just raised $9.2 million for his vibe coding app uh, vibe code, uh, seed round. When he just started the company, he raised $9.2 million. Of course, he's an incredible founder, but $9.2 million for a seed round, this is something that we haven't really seen much before. That is a tremendous amount of money, especially for a first-time founder. Yes, in the past, we've seen 9, 10, 12, $15 million seed rounds, maybe uh, for you know, a second, third, fourth time founder who's had a huge exit. But this, uh, you know, really talented group of people, uh, AI, AI founders, um, you know, raising five, 10, 15, 20 million dollar seed rounds are getting quite common. Uh, is there, you know, the other reason why people say there might be a thin mo, uh, there might be an AI bubble is all, a lot of these startups have the same, a lot of these AI startups have the same base model. So it's really all about distribution. It's almost as if the VCs don't really care that you know, the underlying tech is the same. It's almost like they're you know, not sober in that sense. Um, so that's why some people say that you know, there's a bubble because the VCs are just funding these thin mode uh, companies. The last thing... Uh, one of the main reasons why people say it's an AI bubble is there is shaky unique economics with AI startups. So what they say is, I saw this uh, tweet that summarizes it quite well. It got 2 million views. Why is AI a, ho a house of cards? Number one, you pay $200 a year for an AI app like Cursor. Cursor pays OpenAI $500 for API tokens, $300 of which is VC funding. Number three, OpenAI pays AWS $1,000 for compute, $500 of which is VC funding. 
Number four, AWS pays $10,000 for NVIDIA GPUs. Do you see the problem? Unless you are you as a user are miraculously comfortable paying $1,000 for an AI app, the only thing propping up AI is VC funding. No VC funding? The AI application layer is unprofitable, the LLM layer is unprofitable, the compute layer is unprofitable, and the GPU layer is unsustainable. Now, these are the main reasons why people say it might be an AI bubble. And I think when people see stories like icon.com raising $25 million and then spending $12 million on the domain, it just exacerbates it. So uh, I can understand why people say it's an AI bubble. I'll let you, the listener, the watcher, uh, decide for yourself. Is it an AI bubble? Yes or no? Let me know in the comment section. Sam Altman, the co-founder of OpenAI, just said that it is the era of the idea guy, and he is not wrong. I think that right now is an incredible time to be building a startup. And if you listen to this podcast, chances are you think so too. Now, I think that you can look at trends uh, to basically figure out uh, what are the startup ideas you should be building. So that's exactly why I built ideabrowser.com. Every single day, you're going to get a free startup idea in your inbox, and it's all backed by high-quality data trends. How we do it, people always ask. We use AI agents to go and search what are people looking for and what are they screaming for in terms of products that you should be building and then we hand it on a you know, silver platter for you to go check out. Um, we do have a few paid plans that you know, take it to the next level, uh, give you more ideas, give you more AI agents and more almost like a chat GBT for ideas with it. But you can start for free, ideabrowser.com. And if you're listening to this, I highly recommend it. Let's move on to... Uh, if it isn't an AI bubble, what it, you know? What are the arguments for it's not an AI bubble? The first one is real utility. So a lot of people are downloading apps, buying B two B software, and it's taking tasks that they would take hours to do into minutes. There's also revenue facing workflows. Like people are actually, uh, you know, implementing this in their workflows. It's helping them save time and money. The greatest example, you know, one one of the uh, great examples of real utility is, you know, the Cal AI guys who I think are doing two million dollars uh, plus MRR. In the past, you know, if you wanted, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know Cal AI. It tracks uh, your calories for food. Now you just take a photo with AI, and it basically tells you how many calories. It obviously makes the workflow a lot simpler. Um, so there's real utility there. There's real time savings. So how can it be a bubble? Costs are, number two, costs are falling. So now it's cheaper training and inference, and there's open source pressure. So this, the cost of basically you know, build, building and maintaining these apps uh, is, is get going down. And uh, a lot of people actually don't know what inference is. So I actually wanted to take a quick side quest to explain what inference is. is. Um, so inference in AI um, refers to the process of using a trained model to make predictions or generate outputs based on new input data. So simply put, training is when AI learns, inference is when it uses what it learns. So the analogy, how do you think about it? Think of AI training as teaching a chef every recipe in the world. Inference is the moment you say, make me lasagna, and the chef whips it up on the spot. No more learning, just doing. So the cost of inference, which is really the foundation of AI, is going down and down and down. So, you know, when when you when we're talking about um, the shaky unit economics, maybe the, there is shaky unit economics. But if the costs are going down, maybe it can get profitable. Um, the adoption curve. So there's. You know, an increasing adoption in a lot of these AI apps. I think ChatGPT has 700 million active users. Copilots are being added in core apps every single day, and uh, there's you know been a ton of multi-year enterprise deals. So you know, a lot of the SaaS product, a lot of you know companies have signed deals with AI SaaS companies. It's not like they're going to pull it out of uh, their workflows tomorrow, right? So the bub, you know, if they're 
isn't how could there be a bubble if if uh you know they they've signed a 5 3 a 5 year deal a 3 year deal or 2 year deal uh there's also new moats that are existing so there's proprietary data loops that are happening there's workflow locked in we kind of talked about that with the uh the adoption curve um and there's durable uh capex right there's chips and data centers there's power buildouts uh these are all reasons why there might not be a ai bubble so what does this mean for you how can you play this ai wave well if it is a bubble let's talk about that first you're going to want to focus on cash flow first services if the bubble if you believe that the bubble is going to burst you're just going to want to have a you know low uh, burn business that is making cash flow the second thing is if you work at one of these ai startups don't assume that your equity is worth millions of dollars um, because uh, a lot of funding is happening. And if the rug does get pulled, um, you know, your company that you think is worth $500 million on paper just might not be worth $500 million. Um, so this has happened time and time again and other booms, um, the dot-com boom, of course, uh, the mobile boom, the cloud boom, the social boom, this is, you know, this happens. Uh, if you think it is a bubble, you also might want to think of having small diversified bets. You probably might not want to have all your eggs in one basket. And the last thing is, and, and I, know, I know people are going to say, I can't believe you're saying this, Greg, raise VC. If it is a bubble, you as a founder might want to raise VC. Why? Because you can get a lot of money right now. And if you can create a sustainable business and if you understand that you are in a bubble, but you're going to raise this money and you're going to create a cash flowing profitable business, maybe you don't raise again and it's sort of a one and done round or, you know, you just, you're very conscious about, you know, using that capital. You don't spend it all one place. I know a lot of you, you know, you know, I love bootstrap businesses. Right now I'm building a bootstrap business and I'd love it so much. I'm actually having the most fun in my career doing it. But I will say, like, if you believe that there's a bubble and you believe it's really it, it raise money and you don't raise too much money, you raise the right amount, there might be a play for you there. If you think it isn't a bubble, you're just going to want to remember that distribution matters a lot. You're going to, you know, want to do, yeah, basically focus on distribution uh, focus on getting customers. Um, don't focus on getting every customer. Focus on the customers that you know fit your ICP uh, and play the long game. Um, you're gonna want to you know expand, right? If you don't think it's a bubble, like try to incubate a lot of things. Try to buy companies. Like this is if you think this is the long you know the long term. This is gonna happen for a long time. Like there's. Uh, you can take bets. You can take some of those bets if you believe in it. Um, you're going to want to own the data, not the models. And you're going to remember, you want to remember that the community is the moat. What is always true is you're going to, no matter if you think it's a bubble or not, you're going to want to talk to users weekly. You're going to price for profit early. Retention over trials. Retention is everything. And then remember that there's always an arbitrage around CAC. Meaning, as a little... Uh, Little typo here. I'll fix that. Um, meaning, no matter if it is a bubble or it isn't a bubble, there is some way, some channel, some messaging, some creative that through paid ads, you can get a low enough CAC to get your business profitable customers. Now, the hard part is figuring out what channel that is and what creative that is and what messaging it is and what positioning that is but um it's always going to be true so i want to i want to end with a few things i want to talk about what happens in a bubble well even in a bubble you know it'll start with hype um and by this is someone i've lived through a few of these bubbles it starts with hype there's a crash there's a shakeout and there's real value even in the dot-com era, right? Everyone says, oh, the dot-com era, pets.com raised at this crazy valuation and it was nothing. Um, Amazon came out of the dot-com era, like there's, you know, which is like a trillion dollar company. There's 
there's going to be, if it is a bubble, there's still going to be a trillion dollar company that comes out of this uh, era. And there are benefits to a bubble. Um, you know, you when there is a bubble, there's also a lot of interest. There's just a lot of consumer interest. So distribution tends to be easier during a bubble. Uh, people hear about, let's just say, if it is an AI bubble, people hear about AI, hear about it, and they're interested in it. So distribution becomes easier, easier to get customers. That gives you data. That allows you to create a better product. Um, which helps with retention and creates this flywheel. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you what I think. I'm not gonna tell you if I think it's an AI bubble or not. I I know I've got the smartest audience of Startup Ideas podcast. You are all super smart. I want to see in the comment section what you think. This has been. Um, hope this is. I hope this got your creative juices flowing, and I'll see you next time.